by Gene Shepard. Tuxedos. Oh, yeah, well, they fit, they fit anybody. Uh, they can be washed, you know. Bring it up there, please. Got this rubber tie, you know, you snap out and pop back. Maybe. <laughs> well, we have many services here for those of you out there. How about a celluloid shirt? Would you like one of those? You know, just dip it in the water, put it out, you know. Come on, sing, Joe. Sing, sing. You're singing. Oh, you dancing, singing fool, shepherd, you. <laughs> and here is tonight's salute to Charles Corot. Hey, listen, I have to confess something. Uh, uh, it's confession time. Once in a while, we have to do this. Yeah, you know, somebody wrote me the other day and said, uh, you watch uh, a lot of uh, bad stuff on old late-night television. Well, first of all, I'm not a television fan, in spite of the fact I have a TV show, and maybe that's why. But uh, <laughs> I'm not a television fan. Well, let's face it, baseball players ain't baseball fans, are they, Joe? No way. No, no. Now, wait a minute. You're confusing... Uh, uh, a professional interest with being a fan. A fan sits out there with a Mets hat on his head and uh, eats popcorn and yells. Anytime you see Tom Seaver doing that, I want to see the picture taken of it. Uh, <laughs> no, Joe, you just... Joe, you're a mad fool. That that infuriates everybody. <laughs> Most pros aren't fans. However, uh, I I, uh, I must confess that I that I do have a certain... Uh, a certain uh, deep set, uh, almost uh, uh, insatiable... Uh, uh, hunger to uh, watch uh, late at night uh, indescribably bad movies. It's a form of, I suppose, a form of masochism. I, I, uh, I, I you know, I have to confess that uh, there must be something to that. You know, I don't know many people that would sit through an entire 90-minute uh, 1932 movie starring Jeffrey Lynn and Lola Lane. The millions crying out their approval. Let's hear it. Cheers. My God, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I do. I concede. I do. I do deserve a little applause. <laughs> you know, another thing, I'll tell you, I can't, I can't understand people who watch and listen to and involve themselves with, uh, with, uh, with mass media. Here I am. I'm in this field, you know, up to my... You know what, you know, and there's no way to get out of it. But I, I never can understand it. For example, the other night, uh, I get this letter from this nice lady, uh, apparently in, in glancing, passing, tongue-in-cheek, sardonic uh, non-humor a week or two ago, I mentioned the fact that we had roughly five listeners. You know, I just threw that out. And I get this nice letter from this lady who says the following, Dear Mr. Shepherd, it seems a terrible shame that a radio station of such power as the station that you're on and a program of such obvious talent and humor should have only five listeners. I think this is really disgraceful. And since I am one of those five listeners, I would like to know if I could be put in touch with the other four so that possibly we could get together and uh, have a little club maybe and 
have uh, possibly a few social uh, involvements with one another, since obviously we have certain things in common. Signed, thank you very much, Mrs. Riley of Long Island. I think, should we please five? What are you going to do? I suppose people who went to see Groucho Marx movies really believed he was trying to pretend that he really was J. Cheever Loophole, legal, legal. And he, <laughs> people would write him and say, would you handle my case, Groucho? <laughs> I mean, it, it, sure, you remember what he was at. Would you please give me another chair, Joe? I need it right now. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Everybody needs a chair button in his life. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, God, that's wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And he's... I said at ease. All right, company. This company gonna have the best morale in the whole damn army. And I'll tell you, if we don't have the best damn morale in the whole damn army, I'm gonna do some, I'm gonna do some busting. Gonna be a lot of guys are gonna be sniping a lot of butts in this company if we don't have good morale. And we are gonna have it. Let's hear it now, man. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, thank you, thank you, that is! Now, are there any questions? All right, men, fall out. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, I have been debating uh, one way or the other as to whether or not I should approach this subject. It's a very delicate subject, and uh, it is. Uh, the subject really is, in a sense, the glandular condition uh, that people undergo, the change they undergo when hot weather hits, you know, really hot. Joe, do you feel any, uh, do you feel any quickening of your pulses in the summertime? I mean, I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically here, of course, naturally. No, you don't. Well, uh, I don't know whether you understand what I mean, Joe. I mean, <laughs> you just have said to me in another way in sign language that you do. Well, that's, of course, what I mean. One has to approach this. You mean you always see this? That's right. There are some guys that are obsessed. Uh, I, I've noticed that. Uh, some are obsessed by money. Some are obsessed by women. Uh, I know one guy that's obsessed by Hershey chocolate bars. Uh, some people are obsessed by all three. And it just goes on. <laughs> hey, listen, did you ever have a frozen Milky Way bar? Yeah, that's right. And for those of you who have never tried that, no, I'm telling you, it's the truth. You used to be able to go into a store and buy a frozen Milky Way bar, right? And uh, and and, and uh, you know, it's uh, in our rush towards civilization, all we've produced is granola. I mean, it kind of makes you feel sad. But uh, you know, it's the summertime. I bring these things up. I hate to rub your nose in it, but uh, there were a few things around that were kind of good. Do you remember uh, frozen Milky? Way? How about did you ever have a, a frozen Three Musketeers bar? Did you ever have a Three Musketeers bar? Did you ever have a Powerhouse candy bar? Well, they were always frozen, uh, even when they weren't. I mean, they were the hardest. I know one guy that in one one brief 15-second moment of uh, later regretted ecstasy, he destroyed $1,200 worth of dental work with one Powerhouse candy bar, wiped the entire... <laughs> I mean, it was fantastic. He, I, I was right there when it happened. I, it was in the army, and and a bunch of us were standing there, at, you know, standing around outside the PX. And the only thing you could do—that's one of the great things about uh, being in the armed services—is to begin to begin. You notice that you get, Joe, you were in. You notice you get uh, very basic interests at all times. Your life is not complicated by, say, uh, tax returns. Your <laughs> your life is not complicated by estimated income. Your life is not complicated by uh, all the stuff that you get in your mailbox every day. No way. You just sort of stand around outside the PX, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and one day, one day this guy walks in. We're all standing around the PX. Of course, see, the, the, the reason the PX was so fantastically alluring to us, especially in this, this period in, uh, in our, uh, let's say, in our, our, our rites of passage through uh, the men-at-arms scene, in this one brief moment, there was a girl who worked in the PX, and the entire camp of 136,000 guys were aiming at her. 
t- t- tremendous. I, I just wonder where she is today. Probably she, she can't listen. To, it must be discouraging, though, to have a scene where you are absolutely at the unbelievable pinnacle of all existence and then have it disappear. Now, she's probably just messing around somewhere in a dime store someplace, you know, working in the notions department, and nobody cares one way or the other. But there was a time when Marie, behind the cash register at the PX, had 136,000 guys who had only one thought every time they went in the PX. They all pretended they were looking for a, you know, a Milky Way bar, or you come in there and pretend you're trying to buy a Hershey bar. But long lines of guys would stand in silent, just silent contemplation of the total, complete wonder of the female. <laughs> I just wonder how many women know what a, what a, what a, what a, let's say, it's, have you ever, have you ever, uh, when you were in school, do you remember taking a course in physics when this guy took this, this magnet, this electromagnet, and he put iron filings around it? You know, and he says, now this is the way the magnetic field works. And, you know, you see these lines of force. I wonder how many women realize that they are basically the most powerful electromagnet that the world has ever created. Do you agree, Joe? And men are but iron filings. <laughs> oh, well, listen. <laughs> Joe doesn't want to accept that. <laughs> he likes to believe that they're all unbelievably in love with him. But the, as a matter of fact, Joe, this is merely one of the great illusions that man has always suffered. And uh, they have written great dramas about Lysistrata, for heaven's sakes, Joe. I know that that did not appear on TV. Uh, and, and the TV guide is not going to deal with Sophocles. And I'm uh, very certain that Aristophanes has eluded you, Joe. But uh, this has been a problem ever since the very earliest days of the of the Roman Greco Empire. But uh, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> seriously, folks, as Hugh Down says, uh, we uh, <laughs> the other night, see, I'm sitting there. It's four o'clock in the morning, and uh, it's just festering. Uh, yeah, it's summertime, heat. Uh, I love heat. You're listening to a guy who. Who actually actually loves hot weather? I love it. What really do you do? I mean, I, uh, air conditioning uh, I don't need. No, I love hot weather. Some people hate it. I love it. And, um, and there's a lot of reasons, of course. I mean, the, the metabolic functions and all the rest of it. You know, we we don't want to get into the technicality of this. But to me, hot weather is totally an erotic experience. It is. There's a, there's a certain eroticism of heat. And I'll never forget, uh, somebody wrote me a note and says, uh, Shepard, uh, uh, what do you do, you know, sometimes when you're sitting around late at night? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, they went on to ask other things, but I'm not going to, you know, this is ridiculous. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just telling you that late at night is when the mind begins to nuzzle its way through the murky streams of imagination. And I think a lot of people go to bed too early. And in so doing, their mind never really is, let's say, unleashed. I would recommend uh, for uh, therapy to a lot of people I know. And uh, no, no, no present company involved, but I would like to recommend as therapy once a week, as therapy, staying up till five in the morning. I mean that. No matter what you have to do the next day. <laughs> staying up till five o'clock in the morning. Have you ever stayed awake for three straight days? I have. In fact, I once stayed awake for four, almost four straight days. And that is an experience. You know, at the end of the second day, you, you, you stop being tired. And you get a curious kind of high feeling. Uh, yeah, it was, it's, in, it's not really, it's almost a, a hallucinatory feeling. It's as if uh, you're sort of floating a little bit, you know. And, uh, and, and voices come to you, and there's an occasional echo chamber <laughs> effect. And, and, and then at the end of the third day, it's a whole different scene. 
You know, one of the uh, one of the times that I that I experienced a thing like this one time was somebody wrote and said to me, and, and I'm going to I'm going to quote this letter here because it's it's uh, really what I was thinking doing tonight. Somebody wrote and said, uh, "What's the worst night you ever spent?" It's a good question. What's the worst night you ever spent? The worst, in other words, the worst time you can remember in your life. See, everybody talks about what's the most exciting time, what's the most, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the happiest time. But what's the worst single night that you can remember? Well, I, 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 can, I can tell you without any question, I can remember it very well. Uh, and, and it was spent in a hole. In a hole. I mean, a hole in the ground. And it was spent, it was spent with another guy who was also in the hole in the ground, and we were both soldiers. And we had dug this hole, and we had not slept for roughly, uh, 36 hours. Unshaven. Have you ever gone for, say, uh, Four weeks without a shower, that's a feeling. And without, without even taking your clothes off. <laughs> no, that's the truth. I mean, these are, these are things which, which most people have never really experienced. And once you've experienced this, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unforgettable feeling. It, it, it is. And, and, and this particular night, we had, we had this hole dug in the ground. It was about, uh, we dug. With, with our little, each guy had a, had what they call an entrenching tool. It was just a little, little shovel. One guy had a shovel and the other guy had a pick. You know, you, you were assigned different things. One guy had a shovel. And the idea was to get with a guy that had a pick if you had a shovel. So if you had a shovel, you couldn't, you know, if you were with another guy that had a shovel and you needed a pick, you were in trouble. See, so you get together. One guy has a shovel, one guy has a pick, right? So, uh, it just so happened that, that Goldberg had this pick. And I had a shovel. Well, now the shovel is just a little spade-like thing, and it, it fits into a handle. It is, and it folds. You know, it sticks in your pack. See, so we 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 had dug this hole, and it was just absolutely almost impossible to dig. It was rocky. It was rocks and and gravel and uh, hard-packed clay. And we dug this hole at, in the dark. It was about uh, nine o'clock. We dug the hole in the dark in a driving, freezing rain. And so we chopped away, chopped away, chopped away, until finally we got a hole that was about, oh, probably two and a half feet deep. It was a shallow saucer shape. We couldn't get any deeper, see? So we, we, we decided well, what we're going to do is make the hole uh, with, a, with a groove down the middle so at least there'd be one part that's a little deeper than the other. See, we weren't going to make it a big straight down hole. So we did. We carved this hole that was V-shaped if you took a, if you took a cross section of it. So we V-shaped. So we dug and dug and dug like crazy. And we finally got got the, got the hole as far as we were going to go. We were so so feeling so rotten. We didn't give a damn. You ever get to the point where you don't care what happens? I mean, anymore. So we 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 climbed down in the hole, see. And the rain is coming down. And coming down. And uh, I hear Goldberg flailing around on the goo next to me. See, he, you know, his foot comes out of the mud. It was clay. See. And then he'd, 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 he'd struggle around and he, and he, he had his pack, see, and he, he was laying his head on a pack and a pack kept sinking into the clay. And the next thing you know, his ears are in the clay, see, and he'd pull a pack out of the clay, out of the mud, he'd go, <laughs> he'd pull it out and then he'd swear. I never knew Goldberg could swear so well. In fact, he, uh, he, it wasn't a matter of the words he was saying. It was the intensity. It was the, it was the, 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 the way the the words curved and bounced and and slithered came out, and I'm laying in silence and rain is coming down, and all of a sudden it was about four in the morning. No way, the wind is blowing and this water is slowly filling up until finally we're laying there in the water. See, this is water now. What we've carved really is a very small freezing wading pool, and we are laying in the middle of it. <laughs> so at that point we hear we hear coming from a distance. <coughs> We hear something coming. Say, what the hell now? And then there's a slithering sound, and another guy falls in the hole with us. See, and the waves go. Gober says, Gober says, will you knock it off? 
What are you doing in our hole? The guy's laying there. He says, shut up. And the wind, whoosh, water. We can't see this guy. He can't see us. All three of us are laying in the hole. And there was a, there was a, there was a, <laughs> there had been passed down the order. Absolutely no lights. No way, no lights. And so we're lying in the water there, and, and Colbert says, i got to have a cigarette. Now, I'm not, I don't smoke, see. I said, shut up, Colbert. He said, I'll knock it off. He added another famous GI phrase, which I cannot repeat. This is uh, classified material. We, even at this date, it's highly secret. I says, oh, yeah. It's the kind of ad lib you think after 36 hours of not sleeping and you're laying in a hole. Oh, yeah. So this other guy is quiet. He's saying nothing. See, he's laying down there in the mud, face down, just face down. You can see his, the top of his helmet, see, face down. And Goldberg hollers at this guy. He says, hey, you got a light, soldier? Nothing. He says nothing. Goldberg says, Okay. Crump, laying in the dirt and the rain's coming down. All of a sudden, the other guy, the soldier, this, this new, our friend, says, uh, I got a light if you got a cigarette. Goldberg says, Okay. And so I hear him, you can hear this, <laughs> you hear these feet sucking around, you know, trying to get up. And, and of course, remember, this is absolutely... Uh, illegal what they're about to do see so I I swim over I said what the hell any port in a storm say, I'll have a cigarette too I, I was desperate I'd do anything see and, and, and so I, I I roll over and the water <laughs> pours in on me and I I face my head it's incidentally it was it was so watery and so wet it was like turning your boat around uh, when you went around, you know, it was like facing your ship into the into the into the wind. So I turn around, and here I see these huddled characters, and one of them's got a hold of a shelter half. Now a shelter half is a piece of canvas, really, and uh, it's supposed to be waterproof. Forget it; it's about as waterproof as a towel, you know. And so they're pulling this shelter half out, see, because they every time, <laughs> every time uh, this guy lights a, a match, you see a, a match go. <laughs> the wind and the water it goes out see so they can't get this thing lit so they pull the shelter half over well i stick my head in the shelter half and now the three of us are under the shelter half and it's 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 absolutely unbelievably dark it's black see we're under the shelter half. the water is coming down on the top of it it's it's freezing all over the place and goldberg says okay he says i like this i like the match give me the match the guy says okay you light it so he hands it to Goldberg, and Goldberg's huddled, and I can see his hands in the dark. See, and at that point, he says, "Okay, give me a cigarette." The other guy says, "All right." So they got two cigarettes. I says, "Give me one." So somebody hands me one in the dark. And the, you hear the rain. You hear once in a while footsteps go by the hole. At that point, Goldberg lights the match. I see Goldberg's face. Goldberg's face looked like a cantaloupe with hair. Yeah, he, you know, his helmet down, his eyeballs sort of red. <laughs> he had no sleep for 36 hours. His eyeballs are red. You see these big bags. He's got, he's got a heavy growth of beard. And Goldberg's holding this mat, see, underneath this helmet, underneath this shelter half. See, you can see the top of his helmet gleam. And it was then that I saw it. This other guy's got his helmet on. And on the helmet is a silver eagle. You mean you don't know what a silver eagle is? How long were you in the Navy? Did you ever see a person with a silver eagle on his collar? You never did. They have them in the Navy. You mean you never heard of a chicken colonel? <laughs> you mean you never saw? You wouldn't know that. I mean, you wouldn't understand that. Of course not. This is a colonel. He's laying a hole with us. And we're, we're, we're lighting a cigarette, which is illegal. And the order had come down from the colonel not to smoke. 
that colonel's laying in, in this hole with us. He says, he's watched that cigarette. Just give me it. So all the three of us are laying in the hole with this shelter half over us, and, and you could see that silver eagle gleaming. There was no difference between the three of us. We're laying there. He's sucking away at the cigarette, and then finishes the cigarette. It's dark now under the shelter half, and he says, don't say nothing. Goldberg says, no, 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 sir, no. He says, don't give me no sir on his shoulder half. Don't say nothing. Goldberg says, uh, uh, no. At that point, he pulls back the shoulder half and he gets up out of the hole. <laughs> Water dripping down all over us and he runs away into the darkness. <laughs> we just lay there. About a half an hour, finally Goldberg says, what the hell was that? I said, that was a colonel. He said, I know that, stupid. What was he doing in the hole here with us? He says, how the hell do I know? Rain's coming down. And early the next morning, at ten minutes past five, the battalion was strung out in the rain. Still no sleep. And up there ahead in the jeep, sitting there, was the same guy. The eagle. And he drives past the battalion in the jeep, and splashing the water all over us. He just looks, says nothing. Goldberg looks, says nothing. I looked and said nothing. Then way down at the end of the line, somebody hollered, Cobrate! And we slogged off in the goo. You like that night? It was never mentioned again. But then there was another night. I'll tell you about another night. You want to hear another bad night? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, you have also bad nights when you're just, when you're just uh, uh, least expecting it. One night, this was in college, one night I had gotten a note from my chemistry instructor at four o'clock that afternoon, and I was swinging up to this point. You know, there's there's times in your life when everything all fits together, and it's so great. Oh man, you know, I, I I had met a girl about three weeks before in the in school, and uh, I did you ever have uh, David? I have to ask you this question, and uh, you don't have to answer it. Did you ever have a uh, a college romance? No? Well, you missed it. I'll tell you, that's a, that's a special experience. And I had fallen unbelievably in love with this girl. You know, well, you, you think you are. You know, you know the, you know the thing where, where you, where you can hardly wait to see her every five minutes you're trying to, trying to get in touch. You know the feeling, you know, running down the stairs to meet her and all that stuff and running across campus and then she's not there. What the hell happened? She's five minutes late. You know, you, you imagine her, uh, having a scene with this basketball player and you find, you know, and, and one night, right in the peak of my ecstasy, my absolute, uh, everything was coming together. Life was one long song. I got a note encased in an envelope. <laughs> and I didn't even open it, see? I just, you know, I'm fat, dumb, and happy, you know. I go to, I go to dinner down at the cafeteria, you know, and I eat the meatloaf and, and the, the mashed potatoes, and I wash it down with the, with the Kool-Aid, you know, and the stuff, and, and uh, I go drifting back to the dormitory, saying, "I'm, I'm really, and I'm going to have this date." See, so, so uh, I go into the dormitory, I throw my books into the into the room, and I go running back out in the hall and go down and and uh, go, go across the lawn, and there I meet this girl. Her name was Effie. I'll never forget her. Effie, terrible name. I meet Effie. See, and Effie and I, we had this scene where you know, just like you see in in uh, in bad movies, you know, where she comes running down the steps and you come running, you know, the arms. I say, Effie. She says, "Whoa!" and uh, we had this brief moment of ecstasy, and we went down, we had a Coke, we had a hot dog, we walked around the campus, and all the while, I'm, I'm not realizing what's, what's about to face me. I come back to my room, and I walk in, it's 10 o'clock, I say, I think I get to bed early tonight, what the hell, you know, and I walk in, and uh, my books are laying there, and sticking out of, a, of an English textbook was that un, unopened envelope from this teacher. At that point, I said, ah, take a look at this. I figure, you know, he's saying uh, something like, uh, there will be a meeting of the biology club. How about you showing up? So I opened the thing up, 
and it said, You are failing chemistry. Unless you pass a special exam, which I'm going to give you tomorrow at four, you will be done in my course. And all of a sudden, it all collapsed. <laughs> I mean, because I have to add one more thing. And uh, this is a, this is a, this is a sort of an addenda to it. Why it is? I thought that I had been making it back in chemistry. And that night, I stayed up all night, looking at a at a at a solid at a at a textbook of uh, well carbon compounds primarily, uh, <laughs> organic chemistry, and for some reason or other, nothing made sense. Have you ever had the where, where your head just won't work? It was unbelievable hell. And I just sat there all night looking at this thing, going back over page after page, saying to myself, now read it. Start at, start at the beginning. It's, it, these are, these are English sentences. These are, these are English words. And I'd, uh, I'd, I'd start at the top. Uh, the organic, the, the, uh, carbon compounds consist of, I couldn't think of what the word consist meant even. Consist. What do you mean consist? Hey, hey, gasser, what does consist mean? It's all shut up, stupid. I can't. I'm on the phone. Oh, God. Night. That night dragged by at six o'clock in the morning. I knew I was dead. Put the thing down. I went out in the hall, called up Effie. Says, Effie, I'm failing chemistry. I woke her up in her sorority house. She said, what? I says, I'm failing chemistry. She says, why are you telling me? I said, well, I'm going to flunk out. She said, well, don't bother me, I'm asleep. She hung up. She said, don't bother me, I'm asleep. That afternoon at 4 o'clock, I went into the chemistry lab, and Mr. Ryerson said, well, are you all ready? There were four other guys in there. They also were victims. All four looked exactly like I did. Their eyes red. Fear haunting their faces. So they sat silently. He passed out the exams. Blue book. You know the little blue book? He passed out mimeograph, mimeograph formula, various problems. He says, okay. He said, so I want this done by six o'clock. And I started to work. I don't know what happened that instant. My head came back to life. And by 5.30, I finished the exam, gave it to him. He took one look at it. He says, don't worry, it's okay. My God. <laughs> thank you, thank you, gang. Oh, God, I can't tell you how I appreciate it. Oh, oh. Oh, every one of us has known in his days, his time, his quiet, dripping life through the vast siphon of existence. He has known his moments. Can you imagine? You want, you know what titration is? You know what the, you know, you've seen this, you know, you add the solution, and you've got the little valve down at the bottom, and you're counting the drops, and then you're waiting for that moment when, when the, when the, when the solution that you're titrating turns this bright red or this bright orange color, and you're adding drop after drop, drop after drop. Have you ever thought of life as one long titration process? And they're adding the drops. They are adding the drops. You're not. Something is adding. You don't know what it is. And the drops of solution are coming in. You're waiting for this whole thing to turn this beautiful bright orange. And you'll know then that you've reached the critical point. The critical point of total ecstasy. You've never considered life as a type. Well, listen, you've come to the right spot on the dial. This just ain't the Johnny Carson show, buddy. Right up there. <laughs> ah, Goldberg, wherever you are. Ah, Colonel, wherever you are. I'll never forget that gleaming silver eagle under the shelter hand with the driving rain. You thought only Rip Torn did that stuff, huh? Uh huh?
from New York, you've been listening to Inside Gene Shepherd. We invite you to join us again next Tuesday evening, not this Thursday, but next Tuesday evening at five minutes to seven o'clock for our next presentation of Inside Gene Shepherd. Stay tuned now for BBC Music Showcase. <laughs>